Well, welcome and thanks so much for joining me today for episode five of season four, the Healthy Skeptic MD podcast. I'm Dr. Michael Hockman. I want to again begin today by thanking Scan Health Plan for supporting their Healthy Skeptic MD. It is very much appreciated. My guest today is someone who has truly had an extraordinary career in healthcare and medicine. He's often been called the Forrest Gump of medicine, in fact. Dr. Pedro Joe Greer is currently the founding dean of the Roseman School of Medicine in Las Vegas. We're going to talk today about all all his numerous accomplishments and people he's helped along the way. So I'm not going to get too much into the accolades now, but I will say you will leave today's interview feeling inspired and secondly, laughing. He is a very funny guy. So please do stick around for that. If you do find today's uh, episode engaging, please search and subscribe to the Healthy Skeptic MD wherever it is that you listen to podcasts. Please leave a review. If you have a chance, pass it along to friends, family, and others who might be interested. And if you're listening to the audio version, to do search and subscribe to the YouTube channel, Healthy Skeptic MD. Okay, so before we jump into our interview with Dr. Greer, as always, let's do a quick rundown of the health news of the week, starting with COVID. Now, in Unfortunately, we do seem to be seeing a trend in the wrong direction with COVID rising rates, particularly due to the Delta variant. And we're starting to see reintroduction of these public health preventative measures such as masking. So one question I'm getting with increasing frequency from my patients is whether you should consider getting a booster dose, particularly if you have a, a weakened immune system. So particularly this question is coming from patients who have had cancer or on medications that suppress the immune, immune system, autoimmune diseases, patients who have had uh, prior uh, transplants and, and so forth. And actually a couple countries, Israel and France, have begun offering a booster dose or a third dose to patients who fall in these immunocompromised categories. The short answer is that uh, this is an evidence-free zone, but certainly if cases continue to rise, it is something to consider if you do have a weakened immune system and something that you might bring to your doctor to discuss on a case-by-case -case basis. And in the meantime, hopefully we'll start to get a little more uh, data about the, the pros and cons of a booster dose uh, in those with a weakened immune systems. The second news item I want to touch on uh, has to do with the COVID-19 medication uh, ivermectin. Uh, it's been hailed at times as a wonder drug for uh, COVID-19, along with hydroxychloroquine and a number of other uh, similar medications. And as you may be aware, the data have been mixed. There have been some very favorable studies, but also some studies that have failed to demonstrate uh, result. So the big news this week is that one of the most favorable studies that's often been cited uh, on ivermectin, an Egyptian study, was withdrawn due to uh, concerns about the validity of the data. And sadly, this has been a pattern that we've seen multiple times throughout this pandemic with uh, initially favorable data subsequently not withstanding the test of time. And unfortunately, this is also a pattern we see all the time uh, in medicine. And this explains a great case example for why I tend to take a more cautious approach, uh, a healthy skeptic approach, if you will, with many uh, new medical uh, technologies and really waiting to see the evidence um, before widely adopting new treatments. Finally, today, I'm going to end with some good news, a new study in JAMA Internal Medicine that found a nice link between cycling and lower mortality, in particular, cardiovascular mortality. And what was particularly notable is that it also looked at patients who had not been cycling and not been um, physically active and who started cycling programs, and it found a subsequent nice reduction in cardiovascular event rates. So it really highlights the point that it is never too late to start cycling or any other exercise program. So that's it for the news summary. Let's jump into our interview with Dr. Joe Greer. Well, welcome to the Healthy Skeptic MD, Dr. Joe Greer. Thank you so much for having me here and call me Joe. I looked at my birth certificate. There's no doctor. And uh, you're joining us from the Florida Keys on your vacation today, as I understand it. I, I surely am. Isla Mirada, Florida, the uh, what we refer to as a drinking village with a fishing problem. <laughs> Sounds like a place that would be fun to visit. It is. Anytime you'd like to come down at the toe, we've had this in our family for 40 years. It's a little place, but you know. You do have a deep connection to South Florida. You're, you're Cuban uh, and of Irish descent as well, and you were born in, in Miami. Um, what was it like growing up in Southern Florida and Miami in the 1960s and 70s? I was actually born here by accident, went right back to Cuba, came back when I was about four years old. So it was very interesting. You have to remember that we're at the time, it, South Florida was still part of the Deep South. 
Now they say you got to go north from Miami if you want to go south. And I remember then as time went on, we're going in through the 60s into the 70s when, you know, there'd be bumper stickers that said, well, the last American leaving Miami, please uh, bring the, the American flag with them. So it was interesting. And then when I went to college to go play uh, football, was I think the third, second, third, fourth year that they had desegregated the Southeastern Conference. When I first entered college, actually, medicine was the last thing on my mind. My father is the first one in our family to finish high school, much less go to college and become a physician. And he was a great role model. And we, in 1962, we moved into a uh, middle-class, working-class neighborhood. I'm a next-door neighbor of mine was a motorcycle cop. The guy across the street was a very successful mechanic, car mechanic. And my father was a physician, but he never left that neighborhood, no matter how well he did. And he was a, a person that came from a very rural area in Cuba. Actually, he used to have a great line. He said, son, we're the only family that lost nothing when Fidel took over. I said, how's that? He goes, well, we had nothing. So if you have nothing, you can't lose anything. So in many ways, this country has given us the opportunities to be where we are. But I grew up with a really deep sense of social justice and civil rights. And my mother was very, very big on that with us. So, you know, you, you, I always thought we were doing fine. And, you know, it was my job to take care of the underdogs. So I got beat up a lot. Let me put it that way. I wasn't that big, nor a good street fighter. But the, uh, the idea was, aren't we supposed to leave this world better than when we got here? The, the reasons you went into medicine are, are really the reasons that many of us start out there. And, you know, as I think we're going to talk a little bit about our profession doesn't always live up to those uh, ideals that we start out with. Not, and, not only that, there's a lot of things in our profession we have to change. We really, really do. And, 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 and as people like yourself and with what you're doing as an example, that really makes a sort of difference. Because, I mean, I don't know. It's in a country that has such poor outcomes. How do we justify the bubble we live in and the amount of money we make? Don't get me wrong. I'm like, I'm not returning it. The, uh, my kid spent it, but <laughs> <laughs> too late on that one. That's right. We have a responsibility in this society. We were trained and this is what we're supposed to do. Well, that's actually exactly where I want to start because you have done that throughout your career. You've sort of had a Forrest Gump-like uh, career in medicine, I think you've said, and we'll talk about some of the policy work you've done, and you're now a dean at a, at a very interesting new medical school. We'll, we'll come back to that. But you started your career working with the most vulnerable patients experiencing homelessness. You started a, a clinic and an initiative for them. How did you uh, how, how did you start doing this? And tell us a little bit about that clinic. Well, we all have personal experiences in our lives. And especially coming from an immigrant family and being the only boy in the family, you're responsible for your siblings. And my younger sister, when she was turning 18, wanted to spend her birthday with me, but she was killed in a car accident driving down from the University of Florida. So that was incredibly impactful to me. Equally as impactful was during the actual burial, two school buses of elderly people showed up because she used to volunteer there. And when I started working at the homeless clinic, I found out that my little sister had been volunteering there for years before I even knew about it. So, you know, you sort of go through a lot of different things. You question the existence of God, you question your belief in God. You know, and the I'm so I made a promise to God that if I ever got to be a doctor, I never wanted to let anybody die or suffer alone. The only problem when you make a promise to God where you're going to hide. Well, I found City Hall in Miami because based on their policies, I could see that God had not visited City Hall. And the uh, one of the first cases I had was in the intensive care unit as an intern, actually in the first three months of my internship, I was doing an ICU rotation. And it was a homeless man dying of Miller TB metastatic tuberculosis intubated it had a wristband with his name his date of birth and it said uh, no address which meant he was found homeless and his date of birth didn't seem to correlate with him because he seemed a lot older but growing up on the being on the streets that's not easy so i said let me see if i can find his family at that time back in the early 80s miami only had two homeless shelters 
uh, Miami Rescue Mission and Camilla's House. So I went to them both and I saw a world of poverty that I never even knew existed in my own community. Now, remember, this is the early 80s. So we have the recession with Reagan. You know, uh, Miami's the, the center of cocaine distribution and cocaine usage and HIV hits. And, you know, to try put that around yourself because I always wanted to be a pediatrician. But after my little sister died, I wondered if I could have handled that emotion. So what's the first thing that I get tested with? Well, guess what? Everybody's dying of a disease. Nobody knows what it is. And they're all younger than me. And in Miami, we had you know, the every single subgroup and population at the time was at high risk for it. We had the Caribbean population, particularly with the Haitian population. We had the, uh, the gay population and a very promiscuous city. And I remember with runaways that we would take care of the shelter that these poor kids had never even heard of AIDS or HIV. I don't, it wasn't called HIV at the time. And so it became a time that there was an immediate urgency to do something. So I went to a shelter. I said, I'd like to offer medical care. And the guy who ran it, uh, brother Paul Johnson, who eventually left the order and got married years later, but he was an incredible influence because what he told me, he goes, oh, you're one of those snotty doctors, are you? He goes, before you even get to see a patient, I want you serving food and handing out clothing. So I did that, which was my first introduction to the social determinants of health or at that time, the social determinants of inequality. And then so, we built, go ahead. Well, along those lines, I remember you told, told this very powerful story of being in an emergency room and seeing a, a young man, a boy, I believe, who was homeless, and you offered him a sandwich and he started eating it. And then he actually put it in his pocket and it was clear he was very hungry. What did you learn from that experience and what was going on? That was one of the most impactful experiences I could ever have which gives us the reason to say those who can teach us don't always have to come from the highest institutions of learning. Some might not have even been there. This was a six year old kid. He was there with his brother and his mother was there. And I walked in with a sandwich. And, and first of all, I don't need a sandwich. I'm like a non purging bulimic. Number one, number two, I'm, I'm Cuban Irish Catholic. So I have a deep sense of guilt, no matter what Mia culpa. So I walk in and I hand the sandwich to the youngest kid, the kid, takes it out of the bag, unwraps it, cuts it in half, takes a couple of bites, holds it up and puts it in his pocket. And I looked at him, I said, why'd you do that? Now here I am, you know, I'm a doc, I've done fellowships, you know, been to college, medical school, et cetera, had experiences in life and I can't figure out what this kid is doing. And that little boy just looked at me and said, oh, it's for my brother. He's just as hungry as I am. Now, the city I was living in in Miami, where my daughter is living in our house now, is called Coral Gables. I refer to it as the city for the financially gifted. If I were to offer somebody in my neighborhood a sandwich, they would bring out a tester, sort of like a canary in a cave, to make sure they didn't get sick or die. And here's this little six-year-old kid who thinks of somebody else, although he's hungry, hungry as can be not only hungry as can be, walking in anywhere, they get labeled as homeless because they're homeless. How discriminatory is that? Especially in a society that, you know, looks for, you know, wealth as your only success metric. I mean, what I take from that story, not only just how horrible it is that in a society like ours, that there are six-year-old boys who don't have, have the food, but how people can keep their humanity, that a six-year-old can have that moral compass despite being in the circumstances he's, he's in. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it just, it, it does make you want to go out and, and, and do what you can to help, help people who need it. I remember one year during Christmas, because everybody gets, brings presents for kids during Christmas at our homeless shelter. And we were sitting there with the kids and we asked them, what would you like for Christmas? And this goes back to Socrates telling us question assumptions. And the kids more than once said, you know what we'd really like? Socks and underwear. Nobody donates socks and underwear. And you know, that, that hit me. They weren't talking about a toy. They were talking about something that we take for granted in society. And you know, it's, it's really important. If you're going through a, a department store 
and they're handing out samples of shampoos or perfumes or something like that, take it to the folks that can use it. You know, people like to feel nice and smell nice. Except some, some elected officials, but that's another. So, so, so you've been, you're talking about uh, social determinants of health here, and you've been talking about this since long before it was the in thing to talk about. You wrote, wrote one of the first books on it, Waking Up in America. And, you know, I think it's very humbling for us as, as healthcare providers that we have gone through all this training, we have these medicines, and yet it's the social determinants that influence health outcomes probably an order of magnitude more than any medication or pill that we can give somebody. What is, what are social determinants of health? I mean, we all have different definitions of it. I, I very simply put it as a non-biologic cause of disease. That could be anything from your zip code to the household you're in, your educational level, transportation, food inequities, uh, making a, a living wage. And one of the things that we found going through all this was First of all, it's, you know, in some studies, up to 80% of diseases are caused by social determinants. But the idea of dealing with social determinants is not to save the healthcare system money, which it does. It's to bring people back to resilience. We're not here to protect the industry. We're here to improve people's lives. We're not here to make, it, make them better at being poor. We're here to give them opportunities. And so it, it becomes an important issue and it has to be fully integrated into the educational system of producing the future healthcare providers, period. Well, if you wanna hear about this in, in a really authentic way, uh, read the book, Waking Up in America, which I think was published two or three decades ago now, Joe? 1999. Yeah, so, so long before and this was on the tip of our tongue. Seven people have read it and they're all family members, so. <laughs> Same with my books. In fact, I, I, I market it as a sleep aid if uh, non pharmacologic sleep aid. When I, I did book talks, I said, all proceeds are going towards education. I said, my children's. <laughs> <laughs> but it will go towards education. Well, well, the reason I commend it to people is because it really is one of the first uh, descriptions of what social determinants uh, are, uh, you know, from someone front lines who who lived it, and and no population perhaps is this more important for than patients who are lacking homes. Uh, and uh, so, tell tell us a little bit about what it was like in in South Florida to care for for this population in in the eighties, nineties, and early two thousands. Well, it was sort of interesting. First of all, I was in a Catholic shelter, and that's where I was. You have crack. You have the recession, you have the whole cocaine economy going on, and you have people exchanging sex for drugs or money. And so back then I started handing out condoms in the clinic. Needless to say, that's not a very positive thing to do in a Catholic facility. And I was actually reported to the bishop. We ended up becoming very good friends, Bishop McCarthy. And I remember he asked me to come by his residence on a Saturday. And you can just imagine, you know, the bishops did not live poorly. And uh, when I got there and he said, Dr. Greer, I, I hear you're, you're handing condoms to the homeless in a Catholic facility. You know, I mean, what, what do you say? I go, yeah, but I'm putting holes in them. We bless them. He didn't, he didn't think that was funny. I thought it was pretty funny to break the ice. And we ended up having a very long discussion on the sanctity of life. And when you get to be that powerful a position within a bubble like the Catholic Church or even a bubble like healthcare and its industries, you know, he didn't understand the realities of what was going on in the streets. And when I explained to them, this was not sex for procreation. This was sex for drugs or for money for drugs. And he called his aide over. A few minutes later, the aide came back. And what he told me was, well, the sidewalk doesn't belong to the church. You could do whatever you'd like there. The best thing he did was he gets, I get a call from him a week later. He wants to bring out all the religious leaders and do a press conference under the bridge where the homeless were, which he did, which that eventually formed what we call the homeless trust, which helps pay for homeless care in South Florida. 
Well, what I love about that story is the pragmatism there. And I feel like that that's what's lacking in our political system. People become right. ideologic and don't do the common sense things that could actually really make a difference for people. If we can just put ideology aside and find a way to make everyone <laughs> not focus on our areas of agreement rather than our where we don't see eye to eye. Ideology, really? You think from an Irish and Cuban background, there's a lot of that? <laughs> the, uh, and believe that, it or not, from politicians, too. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But, you know, it's important. It's, it's, it's I remember when my daughter was at uh, law school and she was very interested in policy. And she felt that the only way you can really make effective changes from the top. And I tried to explain to her, no, it doesn't work that way because you can make an effective policy say, change, but if, if the boots on the ground aren't ready for it, it doesn't make a damn difference. So it's a combination of working it from the bottom. And I truly believe that real policy change should come from the bottom. up. Because, I, I completely agree. And you have to look at it that way. The I was with uh, Lou Sullivan back, my goodness, the, I guess it was 84, 80, 85, 86. 87. And if you remember correctly, 85 was the first year we had a report on minority health. It wasn't even funded yet. And he actually was the first one to come out and say, we need more minority physicians. Now, what I disagreed with was he said, and I remember this at the old HHS building, because I remember the conference room had a round table. And that reminded me of the Vietnam War where the Paris Peace Accord took a year because they couldn't figure out the shape of the table. Finally, they settled on round. So one year of more people getting killed. But uh, when he said that, I was all for it, but not about the part that you have to go back to your community. We know historically that that, that happens and that's good. But, you know, I raised my hand and I just said, Ekumi, Ekumi, my name is Pedro. Do, do I only get the barrio? Does John Smith III get like Wall Street? Is that how this works? Because that's his barrio? Or shouldn't we all be taking care of all people? And it becomes important that we take those four years of medical school and maybe even look at how we have pre-med requirements so that physicians, future physicians, can fully understand the breadth of our society and all the different things that go on, all the different cultures, all the different communities, all the different socioeconomic levels and that how that affects somebody's health. And then one of the things that we started with our educational system at our prior institution that we started that medical school was we would do household visits. We would only target homes that were uninsured, which meant some of them were undocumented. And why was that? Well, you, you know how when you start something, they always tell you go for the low hanging fruit. My excuse was, look, I'm the old guy on the block here. I don't have that long of a runway. I'm not interested in the low hanging fruit. And <clears throat> what we did was we had multidisciplinary teams. The students had to have contact with those households once a month for four years. They got to see longitudinal uh, care, but they also got to see the care of the entire household. And one of the things that we did was realize that the most important unit of measure was not the individual, but the household itself. And then it was the issue of how do you marry policies from the social and the medical? The medical is all individual. Social is all the family. So it's like the two don't want to talk to each other. So what we ended up doing was having uh, two sets of social determinants that we follow on a longitudinal basis, the individual and the household. Because what you got to take into account is if the top breadwinner in the household is not your primary patient, but he's on one of your patients, loses their job, that affects the entire household. It's, it's a important framework to think about it in. And it's actually it, it's something you alluded to before. At, at the SCAN group, we're starting a new medical group for patients experiencing homelessness. And we're trying to think about how much do you focus on the, on the individual versus the social and the family uh, situation. It sounds you, you like got, what you're saying is it's, it's both. It's, it's both. It's, it's 100% both. And by the way, congratulations on what you're doing. I think that's one of the coolest projects I've heard in my career. So, you know, well, coming from you, who's been sort of a godfather in the field of caring for homeless patients, that, that means a lot. We have a lot, uh, a long path ahead of us. Well, anything I can ever do to help, please let me know. And one of the other things that we had the student, the medical student do when they entered the household, they were never allowed to ask, how do you feel? They had to ask, what is your most urgent need? Now, what did that do? That 
put the patient understanding that we understood they were growing, going through. From the medical student perspective, he realized a couple things, or she realized a couple things. We're not the most important members of this group. Not if it's a foreclosure, not if it's a drug addiction, not, you know, there's a lot of things that they need to learn. The other thing that we ended up seeing in our studies with the, these students was they had no decline in empathy after the third year, as you see in most medical students. It's one of the biggest problems we have in, in medical education. People lose that idealism that brought them to the profession. Well, we got to change the way we educate. We got to get them, you know, I mean, at our new medical school, we actually have a wall of social justice. And my favorite poster on there is one that says, nah, Rosa Parks, 1955. So, I mean, it's important we understand our history. It's important we understand the history of our own profession. And, you know, let's just call out the elephant in the room. We're racist, we're sexist, we're xenophobic, we're elitist. It's a good old white boys club, you yeah. know? And we need to change that. I mean, 12% or 10 to 12% of women in academic leadership uh, an academic, academic leadership are women, whereas 40% of the physicians are women or more. If that's not sexism, I don't understand. Five, six yeah. percent are African American, five, six percent are Hispanics. That's not quite representative. It's not matching. Yeah. And at our last institution, because there's a startup, just like the one we're doing here now, you're not going to get the kid that's applying to Stanford. So 70% of those that got into our last institution only got into our institution. 55% were Hispanic and African-American. We had the highest step pass rate and step scores in the entire state. And we only had one student, I think five or six graduating classes before we left that did not match. Good for you. And, and, and I wanted to actually talk about Rosenman School of Medicine. So you're the, uh, the inaugural dean uh, of that institution. And uh, it's very interesting. You've done all these, you worked for George Bush and you worked for the Clinton administration and have done such important policy work, but you've come back to medical education. And I guess my first question is why and how did it lead you to where you are now? About, I guess, almost 20 years ago, I was sitting down with my wife and and I was saying, I've never made so much money and I've never been more unhappy. Mm. I'm not making any change. I, you know, between you and I, I, I quit eating in the doctor's dining room because all they did was complain about not having any money. And I'm thinking, well, you're driving a European car for goodness sakes, okay? You just came back from a European vacation with your family. Where are we not making enough money? We're doing and, okay here. Yeah, we're doing pretty damn good here, you know? So I, I looked at this and I said, well, how can I make effective change? Well, I, I looked at three different options. Get fully involved in policy. Get fully ingrained in the industry with a system. Neither one of the two had as far reaching arms as I could. And policy is great, but then there's a, there's a big difference between policy analysis and policy implementation and, and accepting a policy. And the third one was Maybe I can be involved in training the future workforce to get back to the virtues of, of medicine that we believe so, so strongly in humility, empathy, things like social accountability. I mean, think about it. So we have an opioid crisis, which was fueled by physicians that were listening to pharma when they shouldn't have been. For goodness sakes, in South Florida, we had those pill mills where they would bring busloads down from Georgia, South Carolina, and just write scripts for him. And I remember one time, I thought it was Saturday watching college sports or something like that. And an ad, if the ad wasn't for, you know, erectile dysfunction, because it's just guys watching this thing, then the ad was for opioid induced constipation. And it just hit, what kind of country are we? We're, we're now marketing something for all those that we made addicts. The Band-Aid rather than getting at the root cause. Exactly. And we need to look at that. We as physicians, I believe very strongly, maybe it's because I'm a 60s child, is we need to become true advocates for our patients, true advocates for change in policy, true advocates for the improvement of our patients. Even if it means, you know, we have to change the way we practice medicine. You know, maybe we can't have those little, you just hang up your, uh, your name and start a little office. That's not gonna be the future of medicine. So, so what would you say to a critic who, for example, might say, do we really want to turn doctors into social workers? Is that what you guys are trying to do? 
Now, doctors have to know how to work with social workers. But as medical students, they need to be immersed in what these problems are because they've never been exposed to it before. They know what the heart is because they learned anatomy in elementary school. But they surely don't know what social determinants are. And what is that your vision at Roseman uh, School of Medicine? And, and how is that vision different from, from uh, you know, the, the 1980s medical school? Well, very, very different. Once, you know, the, first and foremost, the tools are different. I mean, I had a stethoscope, an auto, a thermoscope, a hammer, and a tuning fork. That was it. And an EKG that you, you brought in on a table because it was so huge. Now you can get an EKG off with just, uh, you know, putting your two fingers on, on an object. You have bedside ultrasound. We have algorithms and we have AI and we can actually look and make diagnosis is so much easier. So the future physician now has to be able to communicate extremely well. They have to take this information and translate it to the patient. They have to be able to be very comfortable with analytics and metrics, including measuring ourselves. This is about the patient's outcome, not about ours. We have to get rid of this wall, blue wall of defense like as we see in the police forces where you know, I'm gonna protect my fellow uh, physician, even if they have an error. We have to come out and make it better. It has to be about the patient. So those things we have to change within our culture. As far as the social work aspect of it, for goodness sakes, if it's causing 80% of the diseases, don't you think we might wanna know about it? And it affects therapeutic interventions, which means outcomes. I think it's important we're familiar with it. And we also have to be, as physicians, we have to learn to play really well in the sandbox. Right. And I think the critique of the standard medical model is we've just been focusing on the tip of the iceberg. That the argument is that's not our job. That's not what we're trained for. Then let's change the way we're trained. Right. And if, if we just, just focus on our job, the patient's not going to get better and it's going to be for naught. One of the important lessons that I took away from health when we were doing the health reform with uh, uh, Secretary Clinton, it was every group whether it was physicians, nurses, nurse practitioners, would come up and agreed that change needed to be done, just not with them. We got it right. And so when we had the opportunity to start a new medical school at Roseman, we take the experiences from where we have had, we have a clean slate. Instead of saying, what's wrong with society? The first question we need to ask is what's wrong with us and how we're trained? This is our job. So what sh how should a, a, a doctor come out of medical school when they finish uh, at Roseman? What, you know, what, what skills do you hope they have? Critical thinking, creative thinking. We hope that they're more worldly, that they've been exposed to different things, that they understand that if you've seen one community, guess what? You've seen one community. That it's not, you need the analytics and the metrics, but it's about the individual that you're talking to that's in front of you. You also need to realize that we doctors are not gonna do everything. Whether it's working with nurse practitioners or PAs, working with nurses, MAs, working with social workers, working with uh, legal. Because a lot of times in these communities, the first time they get any exposure to the law is they're either being evicted or arrested. And that's hard. So we need to get that there too. So we work with law schools and legal aid to be able to do that. We really, the, the end point has to be not controlling somebody's blood pressure, but making them truly healthy and getting them to resilience. We should be very intense at the beginning and then they don't need us that much anymore. Well, so one of my ulterior motives in inviting you today is that uh, we, I wanna hire doctors like that for our medical group. And I'm sure there are dozens of other health systems that, that wanna do the same. So I sure hope th that your medical students would consider working for a group like ours. Not, not only that, I'm going to tell you, there's a bunch of medical students out there that want to save the world. And what better place to do it in Southern California? Okay. You might be a little short on water, but the sun shines here. Okay. And I love how you put the positive spin on it. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but I mean, my, my son lives out in LA in Silver Lakes. And it's it's a beautiful place. It's a, It's incredibly diverse you have exposure to all these things, including the poorest of the poor and the richest of the rich. So you have a real opportunity to make a difference in somebody's life. And, and I'm going to give you one little story that just always stuck by me. 
one time at our clinic, I used to do this on Tuesday nights when I was an intern and a resident, because that's when I'd get out of my own clinic. And there was an abandoned house across the street from a clinic, and it was a crack house. So I was on call on Monday night, and this was the old days when you were on 36, off 12. So I get there around 7 o'clock at night to start seeing patients. And these guys keep coming in with extreme anxiety and chest pain from the crack house. So I'm, you know, I'm an ex-jock, Cuban-Irish guy. It's like 1130 at night. I'm pretty damn tired, okay? <laughs> So I walk into this crack house and if you've ever been in a crack house, it's a sort of really interesting thing because all you really see is people lighting up their pipes or whatever they're smoking from. And I just went in and said, come on, you guys, you got to stop this right now. I'm really, really tired. And, and I said, just do it during the day. We'll be here in the afternoon. And so about six, seven years later, I'm walking out in front of the VA and this, the old vet guy comes up to me and says, doc, I said, yes, sir. He goes, I want to donate $20 to Camila's. I mean, this could look like a guy that was a working stiff. I said, oh, well, thank you very much. But, you know, we do fundraising and all this. And he goes to me, he goes, no, 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 no. You don't understand. I was in that crack house that night. You scared the hell out of me. You know, remembering how paranoid they are when they're using cocaine, which I didn't remember. And uh, he said, I just want to thank you. You scared me straight. And I'm going, oh, Okay. <laughs> One of the things I do have to say about a medical degree is patients listen to you in a way when you're their doctor that, that they just don't listen to, whether appropriate or not. And I right. think we ought to take it, advantage of that. It, it, exactly. And remember how lucky we are to be physicians. What a, what a gift it is. Let's get it right. Let's make this world better. Let's start off with our own communities. And so, if, we, if we can do that, then, then we, there's a world we can save. Well, you're the right person to be leading a medical school because that's exactly the mentality we need to instill in our future healthcare leaders. I do have two final questions for you, Joe, unrelated sure. to your work in the medical school. First is we have a new president um, who's dealing with a lot right now, but uh, healthcare is one of the big uh, crises we're facing. What would be your one or two or three top recommendations for him? I think we have to get to true universal coverage. Period. And to me, it, regardless who it is, because whether they're documented, whether they're residents, whether they're citizens, if they're within our borders and we don't take care of them, when they become acutely ill, it taxes the system. So if you want to look at it from an economic perspective, look at it that way. The other one is whatever you have has to be transferable. If, if you have insurance in one region, get a job somewhere else, it has to stay there. Because then all the work that some company might have done goes for naught to them. And they're worried about the bottom line. Again, what I really appreciate about that perspective is the pragmatism there. You have your vision, you have your ideals, but you also don't feel like we're living in this bubble. We have to work within what, what makes sense. Right. The work in what makes sense. And guess what, you guys? All of us, men, women, uh, everybody, we could be part of the solution which is a very exciting thing because, you know, when you, when you die, nobody's going to say, wow, what a beautiful house. You so can't die with say, your money. Yep. Yeah, and take it, it to the grave. You cannot at all. You know, what was the old saying by Groucho Mark when they said, you can't take it with you. He said, fine, I'm not going the, uh, but it's about, it really is about doing good in society. We, if we want to be the leaders in this world, you know, it's pretty embarrassing as a physician when you go to a, a meeting around the world and you realize where we rank with health outcomes, not just below every industrialized nation, but below about 35 or 40, depending on what study you're looking at. And if we truly say we're competitive, it's not how many, you know, uh, uh, things that we create or new machines or procedures. Or it's, it's about how healthy are we leaving our society and our communities? Yeah, no, I think if you look at those outcomes and how much we spend on healthcare, it's impossible to not acknowledge that social determinants are driving health, not uh, not the medical system itself. And and by the way, if you do social determinants correctly for the system, it's a fantastic uh, return on investment. It really is. It's particularly when you target it. And and what I suggest is like Uber was not started by a cab driver. Amazon was not started by a bookseller. So we need to bring people outside the medical profession to work with us to figure out what is the best way to do this. 
Yeah, who have that 30,000 foot view that we're missing the forest yeah. for the trees here a bit. Well, along those lines, Joe, my, my last question, you talked about Southern California, beautiful place, but we have such a problem with homelessness. And it, sadly, it is, it is growing in every population, including tragically, the elderly is expected to triple in the next 10 years. Why should we be hopeful right now? Why should we be hopeful? Because we have people like you. People like you that have decided that this is what they want to do with a career. You're, you're, you're this off the wall, brilliant guy that could have done anything you wanted. I have never met your parents. And I'm going to tell you right now, they did a spectacular job. We're going to be hopeful because the battle against bad never ends. It's an ongoing battle. There'll be new drugs. There'll be new this. That's where we have to advocate. The homeless elderly are going to increase because they're on fixed incomes. Nobody can afford to live in this country anymore. So housing is an issue. Does it have to be the doctors that do it? No, but we can be the advocates for it. We can push it. We can make it happen. It's not to build more homeless clinics and homeless shelters. It's to get people from being homeless into resilience and having normal lives. There will always be that gap in society. It's a relative thing. But with this excessive number, it's, it's just wrong. I think you've said that the fact that we need homeless clinics is an indication of the failure of the system. 100%. I remember when we tripled the size of our homeless clinic, I think it was in 98, and we had the ceremony open it up and our advancement person got real mad at me because I said, with this beautiful new, you know, uh, I think it was about an 8,000 square foot building. I said, this is the biggest failure in my career. And when I was asked why, I said, because... If you're tripling the space of a homeless clinic, it means you have at least three times the problem. I'm part of the society. I'm at the receiving end of consequences. That's when you learn you got to go upstream. And then I realized what, what little I knew for housing and all these different things. But at least I knew people I could call and get them involved. And, and that's how you do it. And you always have to take the high road. That's the other really important thing because a lot of opportunities come up that are not good things. Most of them are financial. And we need to take the high road for a very simple reason because it is a battle between good and evil. And you gotta keep, we gotta keep our slate clean. We're representing other people. Nobody elected us. Nobody told us we had to do this. We chose this ourselves. And the other thing is don't get, like I see in a lot of not-for-profits where you know, they begin to have a monopoly on the truth. We don't have the solution, but if we work together, we can come up with one. Well, Joe, I, I want to thank you for your very kind words. My mom will be sending you a check uh, at your <laughs> address that you gave us. Um, and I just have to say, it is so nice to hear the optimism because, you know, 80% of the time I feel optimis optimistic and positive, but some days you just look out in the streets and it's easy to get discouraged yeah. and listening to people like you is, is what keeps us going. So you're in the right place, inspiring young people uh, at, a, at a medical school and uh, the, the Roseman School of Medicine. Think about it if you're, uh, you're pre-med and thinking about a, a place that will be inspiring to do your training. That would be great. You know, there was one time a homeless person taught me something. And I think it's an old military expression, but he, I'm walking under the bridges and he says, Doc, you know what integrity is? I said, no, sir, what is it? He goes, it's what you do when nobody's looking. Hmm. And, you know, that always stuck with me. And it also stuck with me the kindness I found with many of the homeless that I was taking care of. I remember one time under a bridge and then you, you had a road dividing the two underpasses. One side was alcoholics, the other side were crack addicts. And they had their own hierarchy there too. And I remember when I was on the crack side, one of them came up to me and said, Doc, you gotta come out tonight. There's a 14 year old pregnant girl which coming out here to buy crack. You gotta take care of her. I mean, and he, I, that's in the deprivation that that individual was in to think of somebody else that's a good soul. That's a good person. You know? Yeah. It's amazing uh, that people keep their humanity through all the challenges and gosh, right. when we have what we have in a middle-class uh, existence in, in the United States, it, it's just, you gotta, you gotta keep that perspective. And uh, you know, it, it, it comes back because as you said, it's not the money that's going to make you happy. It's, it's what you give back. One, 100%. It's, uh, listen, what you're doing is so spectacular and off the wall and particularly targeting the most vulnerable population. 
of the homeless, which are the elderly? Well, I'm going to commend Scan Group because it's not every organization that would invest in this. Um, it's, 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 so they're, they're the ones that give me the safety net to, to go with it. Well, anything, and I'm offering this, you know, publicly, anything myself or my, our team can do, and we've been working in issues like this, especially I have social scientists that are just, you know, right on with social determinants and different technology that they've developed and looked at and things of that nature to facilitate it. Let me know. I think what you're doing there is something that's going to be utilized all over the country. Well, the offer is appreciated. And one thing that I've, I've loved about working in the, in the homeless healthcare space, unlike any other healthcare environment I've worked in, everyone has said there's more than enough need to go around. Let's work as a team. This problem right. is too big for any one of us. So, uh, so, so that's what's just really inspiring about being able to work in this uh, environment. So, so Joe, I, I want to thank you for taking the time from your vacation to join me today. Uh, your, your career is such an interesting one. You really are the Forrest Gump of, uh, of, of medicine. Um, and we didn't even scratch the surface today. Uh, if you enjoyed what you heard today, please do search and subscribe to the Healthy Skeptic MD wherever you listen to pat- podcasts. Pass it along to others who might be interested and even consider leaving a review. Thanks again, Joe. Leave a great review, okay? <laughs> like, thank you very much.